Welcome to episode 144 of the Various and Sundry podcast. I am your host, Matt Harmon, joined live from the Vault Studio on the beautiful campus of Grace College and Theological Seminary by my good friend, my colleague, my co-host, and the man who is wearing sackcloth and ashes today, John Scott Sloat. I don't think that's totally true. Metaphorically speaking. No, 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 even metaphorically. Like I'm in a pretty, I'm in a pretty uh, positive mood. Okay. Well, uh, well, we'll get to why I thought you might be metaphorically, at least, in sackcloth and ashes here. In, in, in I'm annoyed. In... Certainly, <laughs> I'm annoyed. Okay. Um, this is this is okay. The other day, this is totally off script, but who cares? It's our podcast. Um, the other day, yeah, I'm. I came across someone that. Uh, you would know, passed through here at Grace years ago. Okay. And they posted on social media. And I'm like, I wonder where that person is these days. They kind of lost touch with where they, where they ended up. This person is at a church in a southern state. Okay. The name of the church, are you ready for this? Salty Church. Like Salt and Light? Is that what I, they're going for? I, I guess. It feels like a poor name. I, I I feel like a poor attitude for a church, I, personally. When I hear salty, I, I, I think of when I get annoyed yeah, and maybe a little sarcastic in my speech. A little peevish? Yeah. Yeah, peevish, a great word. Um, I, and so my wife and I have been consistently joking. Um, I think we were the founders of Salty <laughs> Church. What town is Salty Church? It's, it's, or, or are you at liberty to say? Uh, it's, it's somewhere in Florida. Okay, so there's a salt water angle there. I there's guess, a... I guess. Yeah, hmm. they've got a tagline that's like "salty people serve," and I'm like, actually, probably not. <laughs> they probably don't. No, no, <laughs> they they're, they're a very self focused group, the saltinis. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, I don't know. You you being a bit uh, annoyed made me think of. It's interesting to have a church named Salty Church. Yeah, yeah, that is interesting. Yeah. Um, I forget where I saw. Maybe they're this. big proponents of the salt caves. Have you seen these things where you can like you can go in and relax among the crystals? Uh, no, I haven't. But I mean, we have a couple in town here. Do we? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. You must be connected to a part of our community that I'm just not. I think that shocks <laughs> no one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, probably not. Probably not. Have you? Uh, I, I forget where I've seen this, but playing the game of. Uh, Name of a church or name of a marijuana dispensary? No, I have not played that game. <laughs> you know how churches sometimes have these like really kind of out there or edgy names. And so I forget where I saw this, but they were playing this game of they'd name something and you had to guess, is that the name of a church or is it the name of a marijuana dispensary? Holy Roller. <laughs> yeah. That was the first one that came to mind. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um well, we are already way off script here. How are you doing? <laughs> um, I I'm a little uh, I'm a little burnt out. I mean, it was it was homecoming weekend yeah, here on big campus. Weekend so for for someone like you in advancement. So Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, night, I was on campus till eight thirty nine o'clock, uh, talking to people, engaging with our alumni, which was which was wonderful. Yeah, but it is exhausting so. for sure, for sure. Yes, and it was a beautiful weekend in terms of weather. Oh my goodness! Yes, uh, can't ask for much more than the, what we've had. The joke was whoever ordered the weather did a good job, you yeah. know, uh, because yeah. it was just stunning. Uh, yeah, we had a on campus this weekend. We had a concert uh, for a, basically a, a brass conductor we had here a number of years ago by the name of Jerry Franks. Yeah, and he since passed in '93, I believe he passed away. And uh, and so we had something in honor of him, and we invited all of his old band members back, and they came. They came from across the country to be here. One one came from as far as Boston, another from Greenville, South Carolina. I mean, they okay. came from all over. Yeah, um, St. Paul, another one, uh, and they were fantastic. Uh, they were great. Okay, good. And uh, there were probably two hundred fifty people at the concert, three hundred people at the concert. It was it was well attended. Nice. Now. The music was wonderful. The speeches were too long. 
So the program had about three speeches in it, uh-huh. but there was probably about 15. And it was supposed to be a two-hour concert with about probably a half hour of speaking. Okay. It turned into a uh, four-hour concert. Oh, my. With uh, about <laughs> 30, for, for 30 to 45 minutes of music. Oh, wow. Yes. Okay. It was it was wild. It can always be dangerous to put older individuals in front of microphones yes. as they reminisce about the good old days. Yes. Um, That's always a risk. Well, they, they gave this guy's uh, uh, widow a microphone and she, she went up. And when, when, you, when, you, when you give the microphone to a widow, you just know like we're going to buckle up, you yeah. know, and, and yeah. you can't do anything. You can't no. say anything about it. She went about 25. Wow. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Um, but it, but the music was wonderful. It was good to reminisce. It was good to hear a bit of the history, things I did not know about Grace College. Um, and then the connect with alumni who were in town was was excellent as well. Very good. Very good. Well, if you'd like to connect with us, you can find us on Twitter at VNSPod. You can email the show, variousandsundrypodcast at gmail.com. We are on Facebook. We are on YouTube. We would love for you to give us a five-star rating and a review if you feel so moved. That would be great. Uh, Let's go ahead and move into our sports segment here. We did – where do you want to start? I don't know. Let's start with college football. (laughs) Kind of warm you up into it. Okay. Yeah. So uh, did you watch any college football this weekend? No, I was at homecoming. Yeah. No, I, did, I didn't watch it. I didn't figure. That's okay. Uh, Ohio State uh, destroyed Rutgers 49 to 10. That was expected. Yep. The big wrinkle out of that, two things. They had a running back score five touchdowns, tied a school record. The other thing was Ohio State was up, I think it was 49-10 at this point, early fourth quarter, and uh, they ran a fake punt. I, I did see this. Okay. I did see the highlights of this. Yeah, but oh, so 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 they ran the fake punt. The punter gets it easily, gets the first mm-hmm. down easily, and the Rutgers receiver who was back deep is clearly annoyed and absolutely lights the punter up like three yards out of bounds, like so clearly that he got ejected for the hit. Like it was, and then of course the sidelines getting into it. The Rutgers coach comes all the way across the field. And so the Rutgers coach and the Ohio State coach are yelling at each other. They were former, uh, they they were on the same staff together years ago at Ohio State. Mm-hmm. And so after the game, they had the post, uh, post-game handshake. And you could see they were like talking, like trying to, trying to explain like, here's what happened. And basically, I imagine the punter saw something in the field, and he just yes. made that decision. There's a read where yeah. basically he's one of these Australian kickers who rolls out to the right and kicks it on the run. Well, he rolls out to the right, and there is nobody out there. I mean, not a soul within thirty yards of him. So he just takes off like he's supposed to, right? Yeah. Uh, so the co- so the Ohio State coach was trying to explain like that's not a call, that's a read. And in fairness, like Rutgers had like stacked the line of scrimmage to try to block the punt. OK. Well, you tried to block the punt. Ohio State blocked your attempt and you left a gaping hole on the right side of the field that our punter took advantage of. Quit crying. Those are my thoughts. OK. Yeah. Um, Georgia, the number former number one team, struggled at Missouri. They still managed to win by four, but they trailed 55 minutes of that game. Hmm. Uh, so they dropped in the polls to number two. Bama beat um, Arkansas. Big story out of that, Easily. Bryce Young, uh, their Heisman Trophy winning quarterback from last year, hurt his shoulder. And so remains to be seen how severe and how uh, long he might be out with that. So that's a big deal. Well, and there was uh, Ole Miss beat Kentucky as yes. well this weekend. Yes, a that, that will make our Various and Sundry podcast sports correspondent very sad since he's a diehard Kentucky fan. I understand that, but that doesn't mean we don't mention it, right? No. No. Okay. I, okay. I, I, no, I mean we're adults here. We can yeah. We can talk about sad things. Uh, speaking of sad things. Um, oh, goodness. 
<laughs> do you want to move right to the Mets or do you want to start with the Jets? <sighs> we can start with the Mets. That's fine. Okay. So, all right. I'll. What happened? So uh, I think they went into the weekend. Yeah, yeah, they went into the weekend. They were one game up in the division. Yes, um, and we got swept. So they just needed to win one game. One game, and we would have held the tiebreaker. Would have gotten the tiebreaker, mm-hmm. and therefore won the division. Not not for sure won the division, but most likely won the division. And we couldn't we couldn't do that with our three best pitchers on the mound. Yeah. So, I mean, we're still going to make the playoffs. We're still going to be. We're still going to be in. We're going to be in wild card, the week of wild card. Uh, I'm just more annoyed than anything because it – yeah, we're still in the playoffs. Hopefully it's a good kick in the butt yeah. and they realize, you know what? We got we to gotta turn it on. Um, we do have a couple players we're going to get back from the injured list. Hopefully that rejuvenates the lineup a little bit. Okay. But uh, – so I think, I think it's a combination of injuries. I think it's a combination of – they just had a bad September, and if they're if they continue to cool off, it's not going to be a good playoff scenario for yes. them. So, um, I think this is like the second, maybe third series we got swept in this year. Not great timing for sure. Not not great timing. Three or four though, being swept three times is yeah that's, really really good. That's remarkable to have that few. But it looks like we're going to win ninety nine or hundred games, and we're going to finish in second in the division. Okay. We're still going to make the playoffs. Not exactly the way we want to do. And hopefully that angers these these young young men and they can they can go win some baseball okay. games in the playoffs. And then get hot again. I mean, yeah, baseball is a weird sport like that. Things can change yeah. overnight. Yep. So that's how I feel about the Mets. I'm just a little annoyed. Okay. On on to uh a more exciting topic for you. Yeah. How about those J E T S Jets Jets Jets? <gasps> what a game! Uh, so let me, let me. So my wife has been studying for an exam for months on end. Yes, this was her first weekend not studying. And of course, you're busy with homecoming. I had stuff. homecoming. So Sunday, uh, we went up and did apple picking at in Goshen, and then went to my parents' house. And we got there, and they have NFL Sunday ticket. Uh. And we got there in the third quarter and uh, – When things were still bleak. Yes, yes. They were they were down in the third quarter. Yeah. Um, and then the fourth quarter happened and Zach Wilson was I think 10 for 11, mm-hmm. 138 yards in the fourth quarter, converted a fourth down, several third downs and uh, won us the game. Yeah. And it was a – it was a. I'm not going to lie. It was a good feeling. <laughs> uh, so particularly against Pittsburgh, that's yeah. where I went to high school. Yeah, I went to just about every home game the year they won the Super Bowl in 2006, 2007, and uh, saw Jerome Bettis's last game. Have a lot of good friends who are Steelers fans, and it was, it was nice to stick it to them a little bit. Okay. I got no text from Steelers fans yesterday. Shockingly, uh, you got a tweet directed at you. Though, I, I did from see one that. of our yeah. listeners from Danny in Ohio. I did see that. I'd yeah. rather hear at John Sloat recite his multiplication tables than hear anything about the Jets game this week on at VNS Pod. You know, I'm going to be magnanimous in victory here. <laughs> it was a it was a good fought game. Yes, uh, you just. Just don't have Zach Wilson at the end of the day. Yes, to take you down the field in the fourth quarter. Yeah. Instead, they had to put in Kenny Pickett, and he looked good. He looked yes, real good, though. He threw some picks. They were tipped, though. That's uh, that's a rough name, I think, for a quarterback. Pickett. It is. Yeah. 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 Now he does have the benefit of having gone to Pitt. Yeah. And local, ki- local kid in the sense of college. Yeah. Well, and Pitt plays in that stadium, right? So they, he's familiar with the locker rooms. You know, it wasn't a big adjustment for him, and he looked he looked good. Yes, your your uh, magna, magna, magnanimity is that the right word? Uh, in in the face of that tweet is is also uh, impressive in light of the fact that he asked, "Can you at least make him do fractions or percentages?" Yeah. So clearly throwing yeah. shade your way. I'll say this: We're five hundred. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the you, st- you the can st- do that one. The Steelers are not. Yeah. Yes, 
Yes, I think what we've learned this far in the NFL season is that the the Jets might be the best team in the AFC North. The Ravens probably are, but the well, the Jets are in the AFC East. I know. Oh, okay, but that's the oh, joke. Okay. If yeah. they were in the AFC North, okay, they've they've gone. They got a chance. Two and two. <laughs> um. Yeah. So. Anyway. And next week we have the Dolphins. That's a tough task. They've been playing well. Well, Tua is under. Uh, yeah. Did you see that game Thursday night? Uh, I saw the hit. I saw I saw the recap and the hit. I saw it live, and man, that's always scary. Like you can always tell, like when the hands do, start to like they, they do the weird clenching, or they do like you're laying ba- like the player's laying back on the ground, but his hands are like up in yeah. this weird position. Um, and Twitter practically melted down in terms of what is he doing out there? If that's his second concussion, why is he even playing since he probably had a concussion, but on Sunday, but it wasn't diagnosed. Then the Dolphins, was it yesterday, fired the independent doctor. Oh, I did not see that. They fired him. The, the, there's supposed to be – there's an independent neurological consultant basically that does the evaluation of a player if they come off with a head injury. And he cleared him to play. He got fired. Good. Well, and the NFL Players Association was well, an it, investigation and all that. I think that. it's funny that he's an independent neurological doctor and he was fired by the Dolphins. Well, yeah. Yeah. I, <laughs> that doesn't feel very independent. Yeah. I don't know how that <laughs> works, but um, yeah, just a mess. Um, and uh, I will note that uh, – that, that it'll be curious to see how that all develops, how much more looking into the concussion stuff they're going to do. Are they going to change any protocols? Like all well, that kind of stuff. The the Dolphins on a few spots seem to be a mismanaged organization. Like I believe, are they being sued by um, Brian Flores? I believe that's right. Yes, I, I, th- I think he's in that lawsuit. Yep. It feels like things weren't. Is done as professionally, perhaps, as maybe they should have been. Yeah. And now you have this episode with the doctor, and then and then go back even further. The bullying uh, that was happening in the NFL, yeah, uh, was happening in Miami as well. It just seems to be a culture of quirkiness and yeah. unprofessionalism there. Yeah, for sure, for sure. All right. Uh, oh, did you see? Did you see the ending of the Saints Vikings game? That was the London game. No, no. Okay, the the Saints kicker kicked a like sixty yarder to tie it with like two minutes left. Minnesota drives down the field, kicks a field goal to go up three, with like uh, twenty five seconds left. Maybe the Saints drive down the field and get in position for the Saints kicker to try a sixty one yarder. To tie it again to send it to overtime. It hits. Is the, this the double doink? It's the double doink. It hits the hits the upright, then falls down and hits the crossbar and bounces out by just a by just a by few hair. feet. Yeah, 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 yeah. The double doink. Oh man, brutal. Tough way. Brutal. But Chris Olave had a good game in that, so that was fun. Garrett Wilson, by the way, looked quite nice. He's a stud. Yeah. He might be even so good that the Jets can't ruin him, John. Well, we just need to get him the ball. <laughs> that that seems if you get him if you get a two in space and he gets a running start, it feels like he's pretty untouchable. Yeah. Yeah. Um now we had a couple drops yesterday. Did too. he? I didn't see that. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh maybe so, maybe he He's uh, a rookie, yeah. after all. You know, maybe he is uh maybe he needs to read Keyshawn Johnson's book. Yeah, I I would wholeheartedly agree with that sentiment. Yes, for those who don't know, that was entitled. What well, wasn't it? Give me the bleep ball. Yes, yes, yeah, yes. Okay. The the darn ball. Yeah. If we want to the clean, daggum ball. Yeah, if we want to clean up the language. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Speaking um, of clean up, uh, I'll clean up some of Zach Wilson's language. But apparently, in the fourth quarter, when they got on the field, he said, "Let's go win this game." Cleaned up language. With, with with an inserted adjective in there somewhere? Yes. <laughs> Maybe a couple. <laughs> okay. Well, CBS 
they're catching a little flack for this. In the Packers uh, Bucks game, whoever's whoever is supposed to be manning the bleep button must have fallen asleep. Because mm. one of the field mics caught Aaron Rodgers as they were trying to do hurry up and waiting for the officials to spot the ball. Basically hearing Aaron Rodgers saying, you need to spot the bleepity bleep ball. And Tony Rome was like, what 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 Aaron's saying there is like he's like comically trying to like tidy it up. <laughs> Gosh. Uh, Tony, we all heard what what Aaron is saying there and it's not family friendly. I remember when John Gruden was with the Raiders the first time and running up and down the sideline and he just has a very articulate mouth. Yes. And he is clearly saying He's clearly requesting fudge. Yes. <laughs> and 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 is just requesting and offering it all around. Yes. And then CBS or, or whoever in slow motion has his mouth going on the sidelines. Just he's got that nasty snarl with that yeah. bad haircut yeah. and yeah. talking about fudge. <laughs> okay. Are we ready to move on? Yeah, we've gotten as close to the explicit rating as we can without going there, I think. Yes. All right, so our main topic for today, a little different, a little less on the sort of biblical and theological end of things. We're going to talk about productivity, hacks, resources, uh, kind of how we approach the issue. But uh, maybe before we get into the nuts and bolts, maybe we should think a little bit about how should we as Christians approach the whole concept of productivity? Because there's a certain segment of our culture that is like – I mean there's a whole industry. Sure. I mean it's a, it's a billion, maybe a trillion dollar industry for all I know. But like it's huge in terms of you go onto Amazon or you just look anywhere and there's all sorts of uh, techniques and resources and all this sort of stuff about productivity. How should we as Christians think about productivity or is there a distinctively Christian approach to productivity? That's a, uh, probably one of the few things I have to say on the theological end of things. I'm sure you have much more. Is um, we we need a we need a theology of work itself. Why do we mm-hmm. work? How do we work? Why does it matter how we, how we work? Um, I will say that in the realm of productivity, I do think that we are created for cycles of work and cycles of rest. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, we get we get the example in creation of. God working six and resting on a seventh. I, th- I think that's a good model for us of sort of these cycles of work and cycles of rest that come along with them. Um, so I, I think that's one aspect of a, of a way a Christian is going to think differently about their productivity. Okay. Whereas, whereas somebody who, who isn't is maybe going to go like, yeah, I don't mind coming in on Sunday and, and doing this, doing more work or working late into the evening or mm-hmm. what have you. Okay. Yeah. I think it's good. I think that's good. Uh, I think one of the dangers that we as Christians need to be alert to, and this is true in many areas of life, but productivity is a good thing, but it's a terrible ultimate thing. Mm -hmm. And it is, I think, tempting for some people to make productivity an idol, Mm -hmm. that it becomes an end all and be all. And, you know, in one sense, it's Maybe easy to look at the workaholic and be like, well, gosh, the guy that's working 85 hours a week, obviously that guy probably has some form of idolatry towards work or productivity or whatever it might be. But I think it's it's wise to, to recognize even the more subtle forms of that potential for idolatry. And I know that for me personally – this is an area that I that that I can struggle with when it comes to if I have a day where I don't get much done or nothing done, mm-hmm. I feel off. Or I'm tempted to feel like, well, that was a waste. Mm-hmm. When and, and in fairness, it might be depending on how I spent it. Yeah, but it also could be just a. I need to rest actually today, and it's really okay, and not just okay, but good. That I didn't get anything done, or, or you know, per, perhaps family member needs you to be with them, yeah, and you're not going to get much work done. However, <laughs> right. yeah, priorities would dictate that you be with that family member. Yes, and I think this can be an area that it can be challenging for pastors. I think, in particular, or or, or professors, 
But when you serve in a role where um, – it's a blend of there are things you need to get done, but you're, but it's also very people heavy in terms of interacting with people, caring for people, loving people well. You can't always schedule that out yeah. and you can't put that on a to-do list or run it through your getting things done system mm-hmm. and expect to be able to just have a nice and, and tidy package of, yep, check that box, did it. And I also think um, – on this question, sometimes I can struggle with uh, the aspect of there are some things that we're called to do that don't feel productive or don't lend themselves to doing it efficiently or quickly. Mm-hmm. And those are those are very American values. Yeah. yeah. High productivity, even just the idea of productivity doesn't always – easily translate into other cultures. You know, you think of some of these cultures that have a built-in like siesta in the afternoon where it's like for two hours every afternoon, everybody just kind of shuts the shops down, you take a nap. Like that that just doesn't happen here in the States except for maybe in ethnic neighborhoods where that's part of their home culture. Yeah. There's a joke on Twitter that that if you email somebody during summer vacation and and – I particularly think of the Scandinavian countries uh, in the summer. It's like you'll get an auto reply email. It's like, hey, my family and I, we've gone up to our cabin in the north for 12 weeks. Yeah. I'll be checking email every three <laughs> to four days. I may or may not get back to you. I'll be back in the office full time at this time. Yeah. In September or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you'll get an email from an American like, I just had kidney surgery yesterday, but I still think I can make that meeting tomorrow. Right. You know? Right. Um, and that's yeah. just just very different cultures. For sure. For sure. So – uh, it's good to have those kind of caveats in place. We got to be careful about not making productivity an idol. At the same time, though, I do think there is a value for reflecting on here's the time that God has given. Everyone gets 24 hours in their day. That is one of the one of the few sort of universal resources yeah. that every single person gets. There's nobody who gets 25 and nobody who gets 23. Everybody gets 24. How are you going to use it? Obviously, you have to sleep to some degree. You have to eat. You have to do basic necessities Mm -hmm. of life. But then thinking about how can I best use my time that I have for work or productivity purposes? How can I use those to God's glory? That doesn't always mean getting the most tasks done in the shortest amount of time. Mm -hmm. But – if you are productive, if you are efficient, that might free up time to do more of some of the other things that are also very valuable. So, yeah. OK. So let's uh, let's start with you, John. What are some productivity tools that you use? Like as you think about setting up uh, your kind of work life and even just beyond work, I mean I think all of us probably keep a calendar of some kind. Sure. And that goes beyond just – work responsibilities but you know having events on there of like there's a birthday party for this or there's this you know personal event going on so what tools do you use so uh, a few things uh, i'm a big propo- so we have google here on campus uh, i'm a big proponent of using the tools that are built into my email okay. uh, so i'll start i'll s- start with email uh, i uh, um, use a custom email inbox it's called getting things done if you I can put the link into it in the show notes if you want to see the blog post about it. But um, basically, it puts my new email on the left side of the screen Mm -hmm. and a to-do list section, a a awaiting reply section, and a for reference or to read later section. And so I'm able to go through my new emails almost immediately and put them in those sort of categories. And I would say 95% of my emails fall into one of those categories. And so – That helps me to be able to uh, get things done in my email more quickly and make sure I'm replying to what I need to be replying to. Okay. So that's one thing I do. um, For little tasks, I do use the Gmail uh, to-do list right there, Mm -hmm. just setting that up. And then probably probably the other thing that I've started doing in the last probably three, four months is coming in each morning and blocking out every hour of my day uh, to work on things. I find that if I don't do that – 
I turn to my phone and then 20 minutes goes by. But if I have my task set out for an hour, 45 minutes, half hour, whatever it is, I'm able to focus on that thing. Uh, and work on that thing uh, without touching my phone. And I make a make a point to set that off to the side. So giving myself some of those larger blocks uh, okay. to be able to do some of that time. So what do you do for tasks that don't fall into the email category that, that aren't generated by an email request mm-hmm. or aren't just like small things that you want to remember for that particular day? Like, uh, So for example, when you were teaching, when you teach classes for in one of our sessions, yeah, um, how do you manage that sort of to do aspect of I need to make sure I spend time prepping for this class period, or I need to grade these papers, or that sort of thing? I'd literally block it on my calendar. I'd literally put an hour in where I can work on that, or forty five minutes, whatever it is. Okay, it literally goes on the calendar every morning. Gotcha. Every morning I work through that. All right. Yeah. How about yourself? What tools? So, I mean, like you said, uh, in terms of calendar, Gmail, uh, I I mean, well, for email, we have Gmail here on campus. So within that, um, I – the way I set up my inbox is basically I star things that are important that come in that I can't immediately respond to. I mean, some things come into your inbox and you're like, I can take 30 seconds and respond to that. Yeah. Yep, I'll be there. Or – Oh, you requested a file. I know exactly where that is. Here it is. Boom. It's gone. Mm-hmm. But sometimes an email is, you know, you get an email and you're like, that's going to take me a little bit of time to think about and um, f- figure out the best way to respond to that. Or I just need more information before I can even respond to that. Yeah. Then it gets starred. And so my inbox is set up so the starred ones always show up on the top. And then as new emails come in, I always try to immediately process whether I can respond to it immediately or if I can't, then it gets starred so that when I have time to do email, I just click through them like that. And then if it doesn't require a response or I'm just going to ignore it, <laughs> nothing happens. I just sort of I – don't, I don't delete. Do you delete? I archive. OK. Do you archive? No, mine just sort of sit in this massive inbox of, of red messages. But, it ends up being the same. I mean, anytime I look for something, I just go in the search bar. Sure. So, sure. Um, calendar. I use Gmail, uh, our, the the Google Calendar stuff. Um, and then uh, for tasks, I kind of do two things. For longer term stuff, like at the beginning of a semester or, or a session, I will copy all of the sort of things I need to do for that class into the uh, app that I use. It's called Toodle Do. I don't know if you've ever heard of that as a task manager. I, I know there's a million of them out there's there. Million, the, yeah. the, I know there's Todoist yep, and things like that. Yep, I've seen that one. Yep, I use Toodle Do. It's free. It, it does everything I need it to do. Yeah. And so I organize it that way. So that becomes kind of like the master to-do list that I have. That helps me. You know, So that way I can look at Two weeks out, four weeks out, two months out, six months out, I can look at when are tasks coming due that I need to get done. But on a day-to-day basis, probably about a little over a year ago, I went back to analog, meaning I have like a five by eight notebook that each day gets its entry. And so I write down in that on that page, basically, any things that are coming up that day, like, you know, today it would be record the podcast. That's mm-hmm. on there. as It's got a designation as an event, a little circle next to it. Then there's the to-dos, which are things that I need to make sure I get done that day, are little dots with, today I need to work on email, I need to edit the podcast, I need to post this, I need to do, you know, so. And that's what I look at. On a daily basis, but do you, I often, do you use a particular book for that, or is it like I know I know uh, we're going to mention him in a bit, but Cal Newport has a printed daily planner book that works. I don't. I just use a, a five by eight ruled um, lined notebook. Okay, so it's your own system and everything. Well, I've adapted it from Bullet Journal. If you ever heard of Bullet no, Journal, no, I haven't. It's sort of an adapt adaptation of that. 
Um, and I have this leather cover for mm. my – that I change out the inserts when I go through them. And then those get archived essentially. So that's kind of my hybrid. Did you do that? Because I know uh, a few years ago you got a hold of your grandfather's journal. That was that sounds similar. Yes. Is that, that the reason you that, started this? Yes. And so in addition to like to do stuff like I will make notes at the bottom of pages of things that like not every day, but if mm-hmm. something significant happens that day, I'll make a note of it at the bottom of the page. Hmm. Just as a um track record. And then at the end of each month, I've started doing uh, reflections. Hmm. At the end of each month, highlights and reflections from this month. So I just did September. So just thinking back, what were some of the big things that happened? How are things going in these areas? You know, Just a few bullet points. What were the big ref- – can I ask? What are the big reflections from September? Um, so like, I put down in there how much I enjoyed going to teach at Harvest Bible Chapel. Ah, yeah. Um, I put down some stuff about um, some encouraging things I've seen in my in my son's lives, hmm. um, you know, things like that. To kind of make the list. Starting a podcast with Ben Glad. That did make the list. Yes, yeah. yes. So, um, yeah, I've started that. Oh, cool. So it's a nice little. I, I didn't hybrid. know you did that. Yeah, that's that's relatively yeah. new. Relatively new. Um, okay, so what? Uh, in terms of anything that you tried that didn't work for you, which you like, because like, inevitably I think it takes yeah. everyone a while to. Oh, that looks cool. Then you try it. And you're like, that doesn't work for me. Um, one thing that I tried uh, probably about a year and a half ago, uh, when I was in the seminary here at Grace, we tried to use like a, a big group to do sort of very powerful piece of software. Yeah. And I just I just could not get off the ground with it. It wasn't it wasn't built in. It was a separate application. I really struggled with it. So that that was something that yep. that did not work for me. Um, another thing that doesn't work for me, like I mentioned, that I block off all this time. Yeah. But I always have it as I, I go in with the mindset of I'm interruptible. I yes. want people in my office yep. talking to me, and I'm okay rearranging my whole schedule because I I, I want to be talking to people. Yeah. So I'm okay with changing that schedule. But if somebody's not going to be there, I want to be working on something. Yeah. And I think, and this is something I think for pastors, but also professors and and other other people who aren't, don't have like a, you know, if you have like an eight to five job where you're installing HVAC systems, sure. this doesn't apply to you. But if you're the kind of person that has a large measure of control over your own schedule, I think the trick can be managing your calendar in a way where you have times where it's like, OK, it's it's all right for me to be interrupted. But if I'm not, mm-hmm. I'm going to be working on these things. But there are other things where you're like, I have to have focused time. So yeah. I, ne- I need to basically shut the world off and dive in. And that's where – uh, one of these resources comes in. You've already mentioned his name. Cal Newport has a book called Deep Work yeah. that is really helpful. And not that I implement everything that he talks about in there. But what I've discovered is with with his approach – and it's actually, it's really pretty simple. We've just become people who are so accustomed to quote unquote multitasking, mm-hmm. which is not really multitasking. It's just rapid switching between tasks. That's a difference. Yeah. Um, so when you think you're multitasking by checking email and you know checking social media and working on a sermon or whatever else you might be working on, you're not really multitasking. You're just rapidly switching between multiple tasks. And one of the things that he really advocates for is you can be so much fo- more productive with focused – what he calls deep work by eliminating all distractions except for what you're working on and embracing that. And that in a matter of an hour or two hours, you can often get much more done than you could have with double or triple that time trying to quote unquote multitask because your mind is diverted in three or four or eight different directions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I think that's a, a key coming out of that book and I think uh, something that could be implemented by lots and lots of people. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So what uh, what other resources um, – We've got Cal Newport here, his book, Deep Work. We've got a link to that. And, and I'd mention he has a great podcast called Deep Learning where he kind of explores the ends of deep work. Uh, 
as well as as well as a really good website where he has lots of videos about his topics and books. Okay, good. Um, arguably one of the best uh, treatments on this. It's it's a thicker book to be honest, but you wouldn't have to read the whole thing. Mm-hmm. But Matt Perman, who used to work for Desiring God, wrote a book called What's Best Next? How the Gospel Transforms the Way You Get Things Done. So he does a good job of giving a very biblical and theological framework for thinking about productivity mm-hmm. and then moves on to the practical kind of how-to stuff. It's a bit of an adaptation of the Stephen Covey uh, getting things done version, but – rooted much more in a gospel framework, which is helpful. On a shorter note, uh, C.J. Mahaney has a little PDF on biblical productivity that's available freely online. Yeah, I was, I was scanning through that today a yeah, little bit. Just, I mean, it's not anything uh, near what so Matt Perman does or anybody sure, else, but sure. it's got good thoughts on that. And I think part of what comes out of that that I always cling to is – God is the only one who gets his to-do list done every day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's okay that you don't. Like and resting in God's sovereignty. Pursuing faithfulness, doing what you can and resting at the end of the day that the world is going to continue on even though you didn't get your to-do list done. Yep. Which is not always that's, easy for high uh motor people. Yes. And that's a, a very good word. Yeah. All right, ready to move on? I think so. Time for Today in sports history. Okay, October 4th, 2022 is when this pod drops. October 4th. Okay. Yeah, first week of October. Yeah. Favorite weather month of the year. It's – yes. It's a good It's well, a good month. Love the cool, crisp morning, mm-hmm. warm afternoons. I love having my AC and heat off <laughs> at this time of year. It's wonderful. But, uh, clicking on that fire first thing in the morning to take the chill off the house. OK. That's yeah. nice. See, that fireplace has been going in that house as I learned a few weeks from what I hear from, from oh, yeah. Andrea. Yes. Well, she's she's a chronically cold person. Yes. So not personality-wise, <laughs> yes. uh, temperature-wise. Temperature-wise, yeah. yes. Uh, 1987, October 4th. My goodness. Uh, first scab Sunday of the NFL with replacement players as a result of the player strike. Uh, truly related to the expiration of the 82 collective bargaining agreement. Uh, and then players came back on October 15th. A lot of controversy over that. I mean, terrible football to watch. I'm I do sure. vaguely remember that I was 14 at the time. Yeah, I uh, I was uh, – Not born? Not born. <laughs> Although existed. Yeah. OK. Uh, <laughs> a little too much detail. Yep. Uh, 91, 1991. Uh, the San Jose Sharks played their first NHL game in franchise history, a 4-3 loss in Vancouver. Uh, native Californian Craig Cox uh, scores the club's first goal while Jeff Hackett, Hackett makes an impressive 48 <laughs> saves. Yep. Names always trip me up no matter how simple they are. Yeah. I don't yeah. know what it is. Uh, in 01 – the San Francisco Giants uh, slugger Barry Bonds hits his 70th home run in a 10-2 win against the Astros. Uh, he ties Mark McGuire for the most home runs in a single season. OK. I Steroid struggle, error. I, I struggle with that one. Yeah. Steroid yeah. era. Yeah. Uh, 2018 uh, – oh, boy. Uh, <laughs> New England's Tom Brady – Becomes only uh, the third NFL quarterback to record 500 career touchdown passes uh, as he connects with Josh Gordon in the Patriots' 38-24 win over the Indianapolis Colts at Foxborough. Okay. I think – didn't Aaron Rodgers maybe yesterday throw for his 500th career touchdown pass? He might have. It would be about time. I think that's the case. Yeah. It would be about time. All right. Well, I know you're not going to want to pick Brady. Not and I Bra- know you don't want to pick Barry Bonds. I really don't want to pick Barry Bonds. So that leaves us with the San Jose Sharks or Scab Sunday. Man. Uh, let's go Sharks. Okay. I, can't, I can't remember the last time we were talking about the San Jose Sharks. <laughs> Probably not. Uh, yeah. Um, not to be confused with Baby Shark. Yeah. Well – Scab Sunday is such a negative story, you know? Yeah. I mean, 
I don't know. You're a positive, feel good kind of guy, right? I, I, mean, I try to be. <laughs> my goodness. All right. I think I'm getting more positive the older I get. Is that weird? Really? Is that yeah. weird? Well, I, that feels abnormal. Maybe. Like, I, I, I tend to be more negatively bent by personality. And so I tend to, I think I'm getting maybe more pessimistic as I get old, which is not, that's, that's really not a good thing. I, more pessimistic in the immediate matters of life. Mm. I'm still very optimistic for the long-term future. Yeah, yeah. Because I am a Christian. Yep. Got to be. So Christian optimist over here, <laughs> Matt Harmon. That's right. One thing you liked? Uh, I'm going to go with homecoming this weekend. OK. What a lovely time of people yeah. getting together. Uh, we had a dedication downstairs in the building we're currently in for yeah. a memorial to Jerry Franks. It was and the trumpets lovely. are out in the lobby here. Did you see those? I the, did. The one in the back, the, the one that looks more like a bugle, did okay. you see that, mm-hmm. is from the 1700s. France used to announce incoming armies. Oh. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. Anyway. Now but, you just get a text. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now you just get a – well, no, Apple shelter, alerts you. Yeah, shelter in place. Apple will buzz your phone yeah. like it's a – like like they do in those Amber Alerts. Yes. There's an incoming army. Yes. Have you ever gotten one of those like late at night or like – I got one of those in a conference one time. Uh, we were – there was probably 30 of us and everybody's yeah. phone starts going off at the same time. And you're like, what just happened? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Yes. So I'm going to go with um, – there's a podcast that I listen to somewhat regularly called Life and Books and Everything. It's hosted by Kevin DeYoung and sometimes Justin Taylor and Colin Hansen. But Kevin DeYoung clearly is the one who's keeping that thing alive because <laughs> the last few have just been Kevin DeYoung. Just Kevin? Yes. Wow. Just some KDY. So Just going solo. Yes. Because we started our podcast first. Yeah, they and copied us. Basically copied us with yeah. a less clever title. Yes, for sure. And and they can't they can't keep it going, huh? No, I mean, I, and they can't even produce an episode every week. I mean, come on, what what are they doing? Nonetheless, all those criticisms aside, <laughs> uh, two uh, two of the most recent episodes that stand out. He has an end, uh, an interview with Neil Shenvey. That is oh. wide ranging. Uh, Neil Shenvey is about to come out with a book on apologetics. Um, the interview is very good, very helpful, and um, a good listen. And then his most recent episode was an interview with our good friend Don Carson. Oh, was it with Don? Yeah, mostly about his writing ministry, about different books he's written hmm. and uh, that sort of thing. So just very, uh, very interesting to get a, a little peek behind the curtain. Um, Kevin was asking him about uh, the co- a couple of the commentaries he's written, one on John, one on Matthew. I love his John commentary. It's great. It's terrific. And so um, he was asking him, how long did it take you to write those? And so Carson had, had written his dissertation on, on the Gospel of John. Mm-hmm. So he'd done a lot of the work in terms of like background and all that kind of stuff. He's like, well – since I'd done a lot of reading and, and research before that, uh, it took me about a year and a half, which is just staggering. What is it, three, 350 pages, something yeah. like that? Yeah. And the same for his Matthew commentary. Once he had done all the the research and reading, which we don't have to get into this now, but I we, we just write commentaries very differently. Like he's talking about doing all this reading in advance and getting into the secondary literature and all that kind of stuff, taking notes and then writing the commentary. I am the exact opposite. That doesn't make me right, but it's just different. Well, you do you do more text stuff first, and then you go back and you do the research, yes. right? That, yes. That's more. That's a bit more your style. I yeah. There's a generational thing there. I think. Really. I, I do. I do. But in any case, well, if we're going to keep this under 50 minutes, I better do the close pretty quickly here. Go for it. We have talked college football. Yay, Jets. Boo, Mets. Mm, We have talked productivity hacks. We have talked... uh, What did we talk about? San Jose Sharks. Yep. I I got baby sharks stuck in my head. Uh, We have talked about homecoming. We've talked about a podcast that I enjoy. 
And so I think by definition, we have covered our various and sundry topics. And so all that's left to say is until next time, the Lord bless you all real good. Later. Later.